So I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles, if you would, with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And if you would pray with me. Father, you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy to be the object of our every thought, of our every desire, of our every longing, the end of our every goal, the beginning to our every task, And pray that we would set our hope in you. And Father, as we turn our attention towards the worship through your word, may your spirit have its work. May he work within us mightily to bring about Christ in us, to change us. That we would mortify sin that we would lift up and behold Christ and we would experience the joy that only Christ can bring. I pray that you would make this work effectual in our hearts. Amen. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. This morning, we're coming to that concluding portion of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6. Not chapter 7 yet, but chapter 6. And the message this afternoon is entitled, A Father Worthy of Our Trust. A Father Worthy of Our Trust. And it's easy for us to say, but it's hard for us to put into practice, isn't it? And so by way of review, I would say probably one of the big headings one of the ways that you could describe chapter 6 is that you cannot sail under two flags. You cannot sail under two flags. You cannot have two opposing flags on one ship that you fly at the same time. And yet, that's often what our lives look like, isn't it? We're flying two flags as we're sailing through life. But we cannot be deceived. Our hearts will either be aligned with God or with the world. And we know when they're with the world, that's just a nice way of saying, with Satan. We cannot be deceived. One of them will captivate our heart. And when our heart is captivated, there will our trust be too. But we have a Father worthy of our trust. In Matthew 6, 1 through 18, we learned not to seek after men's praise. Not to seek after men's praise, but to seek God's face. That we have an audience of one. That we live to serve Him. That as disciples of Christ, as kingdom citizens, we pursue the face of our Father. Not the applause from men. In Matthew 19 to 24, two weeks ago, we learned not to seek after wealth, but to invest in heaven. And we saw how that concluded in verse 24. No one can be a slave to two masters. You cannot be a slave to God and wealth. And we, we looked at this and recognized where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We saw how often... We don't invest the way that we should. And we recognize too often our spending and our investment and the things we do with our money is no different than the world. The only thing different from the world oftentimes is the label we put on front. Christian. And this is my charity that I give to, a church. But it cannot be that way. When our heart is in heaven... Everything flows there. Everything goes there. 
And a couple things that I mentioned that I forgot to clarify that I would like to. It is so easy for us to become enslaved to things of the world because we live in this world and we need things of this world. It's easy for us to become indebted. And then what happens when we become indebted? We literally have a master over us. But we cannot be aligned, we cannot have allegiance to two masters. We cannot fly two flags. And in Matthew 6, 25 to 34, we're going to learn not to seek after security. Not to seek after security, but to seek after his kingdom and his righteousness. In this passage, Jesus teaches his disciples how to have victory over worry. Anyone here ever worry or have anxiety? Jesus teaches his disciples, and by extension us, how to have victory over worry by illustrating the folly of worry, the need for faith, the character of our Father, and the first place position that he should have in our desires. And so we're going to see the folly, the faith, the Father, and the first place. And I want us to keep in mind that Jesus is speaking to an agrarian society. So, farmers. And we see a lot of that. Some of us may have farms and may work on farms or have a piece of property where we do that. But that's not our main source of income. That's not our main source of sustenance. But we can relate in some ways. We're dependent upon the sun. We're dependent upon rain. Well, here we have hoses and water piped in. And so if we get a drought, we just, oh, I'm just going to go make sure I water my plants. They were dependent upon one season for rain. If the rain didn't fall, they didn't get rain that year. There's two seasons in Israel. The rain season and the dry season. Israel gets about the same amount of rain as London but they get it all at once. And so how do we put this in our terms? Because we're, we're not sitting here going, oh, well, I'm not going to have to worry if the rain doesn't come and my crops don't grow. We could put it in our terms and say, do we worry about a paycheck? Do we worry about Social Security income? Do we worry about that meeting, that interview? That presentation, that job offer, that delivery drop-off, pickup, that bill. There's so many things that we can focus on, that we can worry about, that we do focus on and we do worry about. And Jesus gives us the cure. Look at verse 25 with me, if you will. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> For this reason... I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Do you notice what he says here? It's a prohibition. Do not be worrying. Stop worrying about your life. Now, that's easy to say. But if you're somebody that worries and somebody tells you to stop worrying, do you stop worrying? If, you're, if you worry and someone goes, stop worrying, you know that'll kill you. Now what are you doing? Oh, great. Now I'm going to die. Now you've added one more thing to worry about. But stick with Jesus because he knows what he's doing. He says, do not worry about your life. This word life is soul. He's talking about the totality of life in your body. And notice the first three words here. For this reason. Or it might say in your translation, therefore. On account of this, on account of what? Well, the therefore is there for a reason to make you go back to see what it's there for, right? So what's it there for? What comes before this? We have an audience of one. We're supposed to be single-minded. We're a slave devoted to one master. We're supposed to be disciples having a heart for heaven. Therefore, 
Don't be worried. Because to some, the question arises, if I'm a slave to God, and I get all my treasures and I give them to heaven, how do I live here? And to others, the concept of not seeking wealth means focusing on the basics. But you're not having single-minded devotion. Well, I don't, I don't want to be rich or anything like that, but I need my this, I need my that, I need my this, and I need my that. We're to focus on serving our master. Jesus says here, life is more than food. And if you're worrying about just the basics, what is that but the tip of the iceberg? He's taking it all the way down to the base level. If you're worried about the basics, it only extrapolates from there. Now we can worry about war. We can worry about the government. We can worry about the laws changing. We can worry about all these different things we can sit and worry about. We can turn on the news for 10 minutes and have hours worth to worry about. And as we move through, though, notice that Jesus doesn't forbid eating and the basics of life, but rather he's saying, what, what, what is this motivation? What is this focus? What is this mindset that we're supposed to have? Because if we're worrying, our base position is doubting God. Our base position when we're worrying is that we're doubting God. And so in verse 26, Jesus gives a beautiful example of your father's provision for life. Look at this with me. Verse 26. Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Have you, ever, have you ever done that? Have you ever just stopped and looked at the birds? Most of us have birds that come in the morning around our houses, don't they? If you're up early, you can hear the birds and you can see them going and, and eating worms. Looking for their food. Have you ever stopped and considered them? Because that's what this word, look, it's actually a command. Consider closely. He's saying birds aren't farmers. Birds don't have a nine to five. But they're fed. They're cared for. There is a father that cares. And we don't give much thought to these birds. And that's the point. Jesus is saying you don't give thought to the birds. Nobody gives thought to the birds. But look at them. They're there, day after day, eating and being fed and not worrying. This isn't some random survival of the fittest, evolutionary process. This is your father that's feeding them directly from his hand. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook, Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded, what? The ravens to provide for you there. If you're Elijah, you're thinking this might be a little odd. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Sherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread 
and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Did Elijah die? Did he have food? Did he have money to go buy food? Were there stores available to him? No. God, who is sovereign, who feeds the birds, also fed Elijah with the birds and commanded them by the sovereign power of his hand to go and feed his servant so that he would be able to carry out his will. We see and behold the beautiful majesty, the sovereignty, the supremacy of God who can control birds to bring food. God controls all things. And this is why he says, are you not worth much more than they? Back in Matthew 6. Are you not worth much more than they? Here's the argument. From the lesser to the greater. God cares for these birds that you don't even recognize. You don't even care if they get food. But God cares. How much more for you? He cares much more for his children. Our Father is worthy of our trust. Amen? Somebody's got to say amen. Look at verse 27. Here's a rhetorical question. What does worry accomplish? What does worry accomplish? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And we could get into, is this hour of the life? Is this a cubit to his height, span to the life? What are you going to gain by worrying? What are you going to gain by worrying? Does it add anything beneficial to your condition? When you're hungry and you worry about food, do you all of a sudden feel nourished? Will it fill your heart? When you're upset and worrying about some situation or a person and you worry about it, does it bring peace to your heart? Worry will not lengthen our lives. It will shorten it. It will shorten it. And when we worry, we can sometimes go, thing, go through something more times than once. I'm sure we've all experienced this. Something's coming up tomorrow, the next day, whenever. And what do we do? We think about it. We dwell on it. We don't pray about it. We dwell on it. And we worry. Why? Because we don't want to go through it. But then what happens? We're going through it as we're worrying. It may not even come to pass. And if it does come to pass, now we've gone through it at least twice. We've worried about it. We've brought our whole faculties into it. Only our body hasn't gone through those motions. But we've molded over in our head. And we've gone through it once, and then it comes, and we've gone through it twice. And every other time we worry, we just add more and more to it. Does it help the situation? Does it benefit us in any way? Does worry change the sovereignty of God? Have you ever worried about something so much that God's sovereignty changed and he bowed down to your worrying? No. And you think this is elementary, and it is, but guess what? We still worry, don't we? We still worry. So this is the first step. We need to recognize the folly of worrying. We need to recognize the folly of worrying. It does nothing for us that's beneficial. It does nothing for us. Look with me at verse 28. So we've seen the example that he gives for, for God's provision over life. Verse 28 and 29, we're going to see the example of God's provision for the body. Because he just said, don't be worried about your life in verse 25, and don't be worried about your body. Verse 28. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. Toil and spin. We are surrounded by beauty here in the Pacific Northwest. I saw Brother Alberto outside showing off pictures of beautiful flowers that neither toil nor spin. And they're gorgeous. Aren't they? Some of these flowers that we have 
are beautiful. And sometimes you'll, you'll see an advertisement or you'll see a clip from one of these uh, Hollywood award shows or something and people are trying to dress as fancy as they can sometimes and make themselves look like God's creation, these beautiful flowers, and trying to model fabric and dresses and things and working and toiling and spinning to try and make it look like that, but it never comes anywhere close, does it? There's never anything as beautiful as looking at a flower, holding the petals in your hand and feeling how tender it is and looking at the intricate designs that it has and how each one is unique and how there's so many different designs. We are surrounded by beauty, and they're not clothed by men going out to gather resources and women sitting there spinning cloth. They're done by God. They're created by God. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Kings 4.22. 1 Kings 4.22. We were talking about Solomon and all his glory not being arrayed like this. Let's just get a quick glimpse of what his one day provision was like. Solomon's provision for one day, 1 Kings 4.22, was 30 cores of fine flour and 60 cores of meal. That's 279 gallons of flour and 558 gallons of meal. Ten fat oxen, twenty pasture-fed oxen, a hundred sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fattened fowl. And you can go even on down to chapter 10 and see all the riches that he had, all the wealth that he had. Having all of that, it didn't even compare to the flowers of the field. He still wasn't able to be clothed in a similar fashion as a transient, passing, here today, gone tomorrow, gone tomorrow flower. But what did end up happening when he had all that wealth and all those riches and all that glory? His heart was drawn away from God. It's interesting, you see, God sometimes gives these, these uh, rules, these requirements in sets of three. You have Samson. Where was Samson's power? Don't say in his hair. It was from God, right? And he had taken a vow that he wasn't supposed to do three things. Drink alcohol, touch a dead body, or cut his hair. He drank alcohol, he touched a dead body, and when he cut his hair, that was it. God said, you've denied me all of these times in these three things you were supposed to keep and the last one, that's it. It's gone. Kings in Israel were not supposed to multiply three things. The young guys should know what this is because we talked about it. Gold, women, and horses. Gold, women, and horses. And if you read through 1 Kings 10, you'll see Solomon was multiplying gold, horses, and then women. And he left God. Even with all of these things surrounding him, it didn't benefit him in serving and trusting and pursuing his God. He wasn't even clothed as beautifully as these flowers. But they did do something for him. They drew him away. They drew him away. Let's look back at our passage. Verse 30. But if God, here's another rhetorical exhortation. Verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? 
Jesus intensifies the argument here. He was talking about flowers. Do you notice that change? Now he's talking about grass. He even clothes the grass. Grass doesn't have to have color. You know, it's a beautiful thing when you leave the L.A. area and you come up here during spring and everything's green. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. You go from this dry desert where everything's one color and there's smog everywhere up to fresh air, beautiful smells, and everything is covered with this beautiful green and then it makes all the other colors pop. God doesn't have to do that, but he does for something that's only been prepared to be cast into the furnace as kindling. He even takes time to clothe kindling. And so we have to ask ourselves, would God clothe kindling and not his child? Would God clothe kindling and not his child? And we have a tough time trusting in him for provisions and for daily needs. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 103. We see the lesser David speaking about that here. Psalm 103. Look at verse 15 and 16 with me. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. And its place acknowledges it no longer. You go, wow, that's, that's kind of daunting and depressing. It's true nonetheless, but there, there is a soberness about it, isn't there? But notice the context that it's in. Let's back up to 13 and read to 17. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. Do you see that? David is focusing on the care of God, even other transient, passing things, grass, flowers, us. He cares for us. His loving kindness, that word loving kindness is loyal love, covenant love love. It's an immovable love. When God determines to set his love on something, it cannot be moved. It cannot be moved. So rather than focus on the fleeting and the transient and the perishing nature of the grass and the flower and even our lives, that's the backdrop for this beautiful, beautiful care and compassion and love that does not end. Steadfast love of our Father. Don't miss this. This is the focus that Jesus makes. Look at the care. Look at the, the grass and the flowers. With, they have beauty. They have glory. And they quickly perish. How much more will your Father not care for you? So when we're out and we're walking around and we see these things, When you wake up in the morning and you see these birds coming and eating, pause, reflect, praise your Father. He's still sustaining these birds. He's still sustaining me. This is a picture that has been given so that I might have hope that I might recognize that his compassion will fail not and his love will fail not. And as you're tending to your garden and we're looking even at these beautiful flowers here, we look at them and we say, look at the way God tenderly cares for each petal and causes everything to grow. 
Will he not clothe us? Will he not care for us? Will he not provide our needs? Indeed, he will. He is faithful. He is faithful. It's amazing to think that we doubt and that we worry when we are the apex of his creation and those of us in Christ have been recreated. And we go, oh, look how amazing God is. Look what he can do. He's mighty to save sinners. But he can't supply my daily needs. Therefore, I must worry myself because worrying will fix this problem. That makes no sense. It makes no sense. We must recognize the folly of worry. And we must repent from that folly and have faith and trust in God. That's what Jesus is saying. Look at this. Look at the way he tenderly clothes these things. You've never seen anyone clothed like these flowers. How much more you? And he says, you of little faith, not you of no faith. Which means what? We need to increase our faith. And we can't increase our faith when we're holding on to this folly, this worry. We can't sail two flags on the same ship. We must abandon one and be wholly committed to the other. We must turn away, we must repent from worrying from this folly and turn to Christ and trust in Him and have faith in Him and recognize that we serve Christ He's given us access to the Father. He cares for us. He has compassion for us. And if you're in Christ, you've already been clothed, haven't you? With something that will not perish. All these clothes that we have, we realized, moths will eat, they'll be deteriorated, There'll be some estate sale one day and people will be going through your things and pulling out your clothes. Some of them will be bought, some of them will be burned. But the righteousness of Christ that clothes the believers will never perish and we will wear that for all eternity. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? So we can trust God for the impossible, but we can't trust Him for something somebody else could do. That's sad, isn't it? That's what happens when we worry. We're saying, God, I know you can do all things. I know only you can resurrect my soul from the dead. Even the disciples said, who could do such a thing? And he said, with Man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And we say, amen, and we look to that and we say, only God could save me. Only God could regenerate my heart. But I don't know how this is going to get paid. I don't know how this is going to get done. I don't know how this situation is going to turn out. Some other person, some other human could step in and fix that problem. And we say, God, you could do all things except meet my temporal needs, whatever they may be. We need to keep remembering the truth of Scripture. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. 
Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He gave his son. And you think that you're going to be in your situation, in your trial, in the midst of your life, in need of something, and he's not going to give you something you need when he gave his son? He cares for his children. He is a perfect father. And on the flip side of that, if you have not come to Christ and you think you will escape, when the price that needed to be paid for us to be brought to him was the death of his own son, he killed his son. Do not fool yourself in thinking you will escape. Because if that was the extent to which it was necessary for us to be brought into reconciliation with the Father, he didn't spare his own son. He will not spare you. He will not spare you. You're sorely deceived if you think he will. But because he did not spare his son, the gates of heaven have been flung wide open. And today is a day of salvation. He has made it so easy for you to come to him. There's no chance, there's no works, there's no rosaries, there's no beads. There's turn to him from your sin and trust in him. And that kind of goes along the theme of what we're looking at, doesn't it? Stop worrying and trust in him. Anyone who comes to Christ will not be cast out. That is the promise we have from Scripture. If you come to Him now, you will be saved. I guarantee that. If you spurn Him, there will be no hope for you. For there is only one mediator between God and man, the Lord Christ Jesus. And there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved other than that of Jesus Christ. So I implore you, if you have not come to him, come now. Come now. He will receive you. Don't clean yourself up. Come dirty. He loves to save sinners. It is his joy to save sinners. Humble yourself. Trust in him. Turn from your folly. He is worthy of our trust. Well, if you'll notice in Matthew 6, he continues. How not, how, he, he clothes us. He clothes us with all things we need. The basics of life. Salvation. These are bookended. The basic, most minuscule things and the impossible. And he fills that gap too. All of our needs. And he gives another prohibition. In verse 31, again, do not worry, then saying, what shall we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? So he's kind of wrapping it back around again, saying it twice, right? Which means this is extra important. Now what does this not mean, though? It means that we don't care. It doesn't mean, hey, don't care for your bodies. Don't, don't wear clothes, don't shower, don't plan on budgeting for clothes. or anything. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying we don't plan for the future. He's not saying we can't have money. He's saying what place do all of these things, even the basics of life, have in our heart with relationship to the Father? Do we go to the Father and pray to ask for these things, or do we say, I'm an American, I do what I want, I'll get these things and I'll thank God later? We have to ask ourselves, how much time do we spend on our bodies? How much time do we spend thinking about our hair, or our face, or our clothes, or our nails, or all these things, food, drinking, leisure? Why do we spend this time? Why do we eat? Why are we supposed to eat? 
whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do what? All to the glory of God. So then you have to ask, why do we exercise? It's so easy for us just to walk into any supermarket, any major chain store, and you see all the magazines lined up there, and all these exercise and fitness things. Is it wrong to exercise? No. Is it wrong to be in shape? No. It's good to be in shape. It's good to take care of this vessel. But, just like we've been talking about, good things can become idols. And usually that's where we stumble, isn't it? A lot of us that have been walking with the Lord, we don't go off and start stealing things and robbing banks. But what do we do? We take good things and we worship them. We worship them. Why do we exercise? Why do we eat? Why do we drink? Why do we wear clothing to glorify God? Why do we take medicine or go to the doctor to make sure that we're fit to glorify God? Why do we use social media? Uh-oh. This could be a tough one. Is it to glorify God? Think with me here for a moment. We can step back and we can say, this person has a problem with alcohol. Therefore, they should not have alcohol anymore. And usually they're willing to say, you know what? I have a problem with alcohol, so I choose rather to abstain because I know I have a problem. How many people do that with social media? How many of you know that you have a problem with social media and you keep going back and going, it'll be better this time, it'll be different this time, it'll be better this time? And you're fooling yourself into thinking you can keep doing that. But you look at somebody that's an alcoholic or a drug addict and you go, oh, that's, that's too bad that they're enslaved like that. Not recognizing that you're enslaved to something that's just more socially acceptable. But it's still an idol. You're still worshiping it. And God still sees. And we could make lists of other things too. Is our focus to be pleasing to him in all respects? Are we willing to mortify sins, to cut them off, to put them to death? Even if it's a great cost to ourself to pluck out our eye, cut off our hand, because we have this single-minded focus. I must please Christ, and I will make it to be with him, no matter what the cross, because I love him. He is my heart's desire. So whatever I have to lose to get there, that's what I'll do. Husbands, think about if something were happening to your wife. What would you push through in order to save her? Parents, if something were happening to your children, would you just go, oh, yeah, the house is on fire, but, so not much I can really do. Or would you say, I'll die trying. How much more Christ? Or is there a missed priority there? I'm not saying love your children or love your wives less. I'm saying love Christ more. Are these things your servants or your masters? Social media makes a great servant. Clothes make a great servant. Alcohol can even make a great servant. Wine makes the heart glad. But they all make horrible masters. Paul says it this way. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 13. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. It doesn't matter if it's a natural desire. If it's not for pleasing the Lord, it has to be done away with. We cannot be mastered by anything other than Christ. We cannot fly two sails. And you remember why we fast? To be homesick for heaven? To recognize that we don't need these things on this earth in the way we think we need them. We need to be pleasing to Christ. We pursue Him, and He will fill us with what we need. 1 Timothy 4, 8, For bodily discipline is only of little profit. It doesn't say no profit, but in comparison, little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, 
since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Well, now we look at verse 32. The reason. What is the reason? Don't worry. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? Here's the reason. There's one positive and one negative in reverse order. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. And the second one, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. You see these two reasons side by side. He's giving the negative first. Gentiles. Maybe your Bible says pagans. It's the godless. And you know what's scary? They're not necessarily outside of the church, visible. They're outside of Christ because they lack faith, but they're not necessarily outside of the visible church. Turn with me to Matthew 13. I think sometimes we miss this. Matthew 13, 18. You know the parable of the sower. We're going to jump into the explanation. And if you want to read the parable itself, after you can go back to verse 1. Matthew 13, 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom, listen, the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world, and the deceitfulness of wealth, sounds like our passage last time and this time, doesn't it? Choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. It doesn't say he falls away, does it? It just says he becomes unfruitful. So you have people like this inside the church, visible, not church universal, and outside the church. They're not in Christ, but they attend, and they're members of churches. And the one on, who, on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. I would love to get a return on investment like that, even just with my herb garden. I think that would be great. But God is saying, this is the kind of fruit. It's astronomical. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it does if you recognize you have a sovereign God who holds everything in his hands, who feeds the birds, who clothes the flowers, and who doesn't let any of his children perish without him sovereignly ordaining it and being pleased, as the psalmist says. Precious in his sight is the death of his godly ones because there is a reunion. Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. Now, if we go back to our passage, thinking about this parable of the sower, if, if going through these things, you're thinking about this, and some part of you is angry or some part of you is indifferent to all of this, I would just respond by saying, friend, you need to get saved. This should be moving your heart, not in anger, not in passive indifference, but maybe some sadness or saying, I don't, I don't, don't, I'm missing this mark. Or some joy, my father cares for me. Even though I miss the mark, my father cares for me. But anger and indifference, these should not be emotions that are being stirred up within us right now. But if we hear this and we feel broken because we've fallen short, Take heart. Turn and come back to Christ. He's waiting, ready to wash us, ready to cleanse us, ready to purify us. And then the positive. So the negative is don't be like the non believers, the Gentiles, the pagans. These are the things they seek after. What flag are you flying? Christ is saying. What flag are you flying? What are you following after? And then he says, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. That sounds familiar from the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? Didn't he say that? 
Didn't he say that before? Right before we got into the disciples' prayer? So do not be like them, the Gentiles, the pagans, the non-believers, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus is repeating himself and going back to these same themes. He hasn't redeemed your life just to let you perish. He didn't just save you to say, look what I can do with my power. Now get out of here, kid. You bother me. He's going to bring us all the way safely home. He's going to care for us. Each one of us has perfectly measured out trials and compassions that are unique to each one of us so that we may grow and display the image of Christ. He's not flippant. He's not ignoring. Everything is perfectly measured for you, for your situation, for your life, so that you might be brought into the fullness which is Christ. He who has begun a good work and you will bring it to completion. This is, this is the best part. Because he loves you. If you're in Christ, he loves you. And he will see it done because he's placed his name on the line and he will not deny himself. He knows your needs. He knows your current trial. He knows your pain. He sees it. And he says, come to me. I will help you. Come to me. I love you. We've seen the folly of worry the faith that we must repent of that folly and trust God and the Father. We must remember your Father loves you. Your Father loves you and He cares for you much more than birds, much more than flowers, much more than cattle, much more than any other creature. Even more than other humans that are not in Christ. There is a special love that the Father has for His own that are in Christ. And He will not pass you by. He will not pass you by. He knows what you need and He is worthy of our trust. And so then Jesus says here in verse 33, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Here is the hard contrast. We need to put off that sinful worry that shows our lack of faith. We need to put on a heart for heaven, a heart that seeks our Father's face, a heart that looks toward eternity, not a heart that's focused on this situation and this situation, and I'm looking at my calendar, and I've got this at noon, this at 1.30, this at 3. I'm living my life before the face of God, whom I'm confident I will stand before one day, looking to hear the words, well done, good and faithful slave, enter into the joy of your master. We must seek our king in love. He's our savior. He's our friend. He's our soul's desire, our captain, our counselor. He's precious. He's beautiful. All these things that we look at and see the beauty of came from his mind. All of these things pale in comparison to the beauty which is in Christ. And we can sit and marvel over flowers and their beauty and not have one thought for Christ. It shouldn't be this way. But knowing that he's worthy and knowing that he's beautiful, at what cost do we seek his kingdom? At what cost do we seek his kingdom? We mentioned if, if a family member were in danger, a wife, a child, house on fire, you're not going to say, well, there goes that. but we would for his kingdom. How do we empty ourselves for his kingdom? How do we deny ourselves so that Christ might be glorified? How do we promote righteousness in our family, in our work, in our neighborhood, in our thought life, in this church? How are we pursuing the kingdom, recognizing I have my eyes fixed upon eternity? You've heard that saying, oh, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Really? The most heavenly-minded person I've ever seen, I read about in the scriptures, and his name is Jesus Christ. No earthly good? We must recognize the folly of worry. It's doubt. 
We must repent from folly to trust in God. We must remember that our Father loves us and knows what we need. And we must resolve to give Him first place. His glory. His glory. That's why we're here, to be light bearers of His glory. And as an added benefit, He says, all these things will be added to you. So you're not seeking what the Gentiles are seeking. You're not seeking these basics. You're seeking the face of God. And guess what? He's going to say, good job. Now have all these things. Because you're not seeking after the gift. You're seeking after the giver. And when you seek after the giver, he gives you the gift. When you seek after the gift, you become enslaved to it. God is loving and he cares for his own. Here's another way to put it. Luke says it like this. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. On the surface, it makes no sense. But those of us in Christ know what that means. We cannot pursue the benefits. We must pursue the king. We spent two months studying the disciples' prayer and reminding ourselves of every time, doing a little review as we're going through. And we can't just pray this, we have to live it. We can't just pray this, we have to live it. But what's the order of that prayer? Is it, our Father, who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. No. Hallowed be your name. Let your name be holy. I want to see your glory magnified all across this earth. Your kingdom come. That's what I'm looking forward to. Your will be done. Fervently, quickly, joyfully. And then, give us this day our daily bread, the bread we need for today so that we might fulfill those things. Our third final prohibition, verse 34. So do not worry, another command. He mentions worry six times in here. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care. That word care is worry again. Tomorrow will worry for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We know this, but you know what? Why are we not supposed to worry tomorrow? Because when we worry about tomorrow, what are we in effect saying? God won't be on his throne tomorrow. But we know that's not true. Because he's outside of time. And so tomorrow, he's still on his throne. And in fact, he never changed. We did. We need to have faith. What is faith? The assurance of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen. I have a phone. I know that somebody made this phone. I've never seen who made this phone. But I know it didn't just come from nothing. I look at these flowers and I know they have to have a creator. There's a mind behind this. God has given us so much and it's enough, it's sufficient to condemn we see there's a sovereign hand behind this. I was talking with somebody when we went out evangelizing on Friday night who said that he didn't believe in God. And I said, so you believe in the logical impossibility that nothing created everything? And he scoffed at me. But that's a better, better alternative, isn't it, to recognize I'm dead in my sins. But we can't have that mindset. We can't be like the Gentiles, as he says here, we can't be like the non-believers. We know, we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, haven't we? We've seen it, most of all, in his word. And by his grace, we've experienced it. And we look back over our life, and we have a long list of answered prayers. We have a long list of trials that have grown us, that every time we never wanted to go through. But every time looking back, we're so thankful that God did that to us. And then we think, how much of the things that occupy our thought life, our time, and our planning, and our worrying, will be of any value towards advancing God's kingdom, pursuing His glory? If we stopped and we made an inventory list, this is the thing that I did, this is how I spent my time, this is how it contributed to God's glory. 
What would you cut out? If God were to stand before you and say, well done, good and faithful servant, on this, 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 and this, but not these, what would the these be? Will he say, why did you trust your emotions? Why did you trust your passions? Why didn't you trust me? Jesus is in effect saying, we're, we're not supposed to be governed by our emotions, right? We're not supposed to be governed by our emotions. Emotions aren't bad in themselves. It's a good thing to have emotions. It's kind of weird if somebody doesn't have any emotions, but they're not supposed to govern us, right? We're not led by our emotions. He's not saying don't have any emotions. He's saying bring your emotions in subjection to the will of God. Bring your emotions in subjection to your desire and your love for Christ. That's what he's saying. Become like little children. If you are a father and you have little children, do your kids come up worrying? Are we going to be able to eat today, Dad? Am I going to have clothes to wear? No, they don't. They don't, do they? And you who had fathers when you were young children, did you worry about the food your father was going to provide for you or the clothing he was going to provide for you when you were three, four years old? Was that something that you worried about? Most likely it's not. If our imperfect earthly fathers had our trust and were to become like little children, how much more our perfect heavenly father should he have our trust? When has he wronged you? When has God wronged you? Has he ever done anything unjust towards you? If God doesn't exact perfect justice on you, what does he exact? What does he give? Mercy. Grace. So you're going to get justice or you're going to get mercy and grace. But you will never get injustice, nor have you ever received it. He is worthy of our trust. We need to look at the situation, we need to look at God, and we need to analyze the two, right? Okay, what's going on in this situation? What do I know to be true about this situation? Okay? And two times in the life of this church, we've studied the attributes of God. Next step, what do I know to be true about God? Now, how do I look at this situation? How do I look at this situation? So ask yourself, what's true of God? Well, he's immutable. He doesn't change. That means his promises never change. His decree is sovereign. It never changes. He has no counselors. No one can thwart his plan. Okay, what's he promised to me? He, I promise good to you. I promise not to forsake you. I promise that every trial you receive will be for your benefit because my son, Jesus Christ, learned obedience through suffering. And you're not greater than your master, my son. And so you too will learn obedience through suffering, but I will not give you more than you can handle, and I will be with, there with you. And the goal in this is not bad. The goal in this is for your good, to build you up in Christ. So set your face on me. Seek me, my kingdom, my righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So now we look at the situation a little differently, don't we? And then we remember, he's a good God. He's an all-powerful God. If God didn't want this trial to happen to me, it would not be happening right now. But it is happening right now. So what? So he wants me to glorify him and praise him in the midst of it. So I cannot worry. I need to focus on him. I need to turn away from worrying. I need to have more faith in Christ. I need to recognize my father loves me and desires this for my good and give him first place through this trial. He's jealous. He's faithful. He's jealous for his glory. He's jealous for his people. Not just for you as individuals, but for all of us. All brothers and all sisters in Christ. Because the prayer that we just studied is our Father. We need to recognize the folly of worry. Repent from the folly, trust in God. Remember that your Father loves you. And give him first place in all things. Peter says it like this. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him 
because He cares for you. Isn't that beautiful? He cares for you. We must worship Him alone, for He is worthy. Amen? Father, oh Lord, Your Word is clear, and Lord, we are so thankful that it is, and it gives us hope. Father, give us grace that we may not worry, that we may not focus on the situation or focus on all the limits that we have, but that we may look to you and recognize the love with which you went to purchase us even in sacrificing your only son, giving us of your spirit as a promise, and not only as a promise, but to enable us to do your will that you hold all things together by the word of your power, that you will not leave us or forsake us, that no one can snatch us from your hand, that you desire our good, that we are your children, and you are our Father. We praise you. Amen.